started. Our first speaker this afternoon is a man I've come to love and admire, admire very greatly. He's a very precise thinker, a very deep thinker. When he says something, he's thought through very carefully. And he will provoke your thinking and get you to thinking hard about something. I'd like to introduce Pastor Earl Jones. First, I want to thank you so very much for being <clears throat> patient with me yesterday, and I want to thank you for allowing me to give you that message. And I want to tell you that I love you because you are uh, great people and that you received that message I know and love, and I want to let you know that I love you. I uh, tried to show yesterday what I thought was the situation with Cain and I believe that <clears throat> we could see from that from that point of view that there was something basically wrong or misunderstood with this situation of the evil spirit being the father of Cain and I closed that message with showing that <clears throat> what we saw was simply the first concept or the first witness of a good seed bad seed that relationship and of course I also stated that the second witness of that good seed bad seed concept was with Jacob and Esau now there are many many other good seed bad seed concepts examples in the Bible and brother Pete yesterday brought out quite a few that were good seed bad seed uh, concepts but uh, those were two, and they're, they're critical, very critical to the message that I would like to give today. <clears throat> what does the Bible show as the outward manifestation of being a good seed, bad seed, being good or bad? Or rather, I should maybe ask better, ask that, what does the Bible show as the method that the person outwardly signifies that he loves God and wants to live in accordance with his standards versus a person who simply wants to live by man's standards. It is, to me, simply stated, the blood covenants. It's as simple as that. Now, we know that the blood covenants were done differently in the days of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant with respect to the way it is done in the New Covenants uh, and the, or the New Testament. Now I've titled my message the just very simply the Blood Covenants and it is to be a second part or a sequel to the message that I gave yesterday the father of Cain and I believe that in order for us to understand this we have to put them together to take away something yesterday, we have to show something today that uh, makes sense to fill that void in our thinking. Now, when I refer to God's standards, I am talking about His, God's, laws, statutes, and judgments. I am saying that God sets the rules by which we are supposed to live and the system we are supposed to teach to others. And in Genesis 2 and 5, there was not a man to till the ground. Now, that simply meant that Adam was given the charge to teach other peoples, the other pre-Adamic peoples on the face of the earth, of God's laws, statutes, and judgments. God's standards as compared to the standards of man and that he was to do that type of teaching and not just the sweet by and by and the hereafter and of course we have so desperately failed him because we're spending our time in our Judeo-Christian churches speaking of the sweet by and by uh, to the exclusion of his laws statutes and judgments so we have 
we have failed God as Adamic man. Now, when I refer to man's standards, I'm talking about a system that Eve uh, was taught by the pre-Adamic person, where that God's in you and you will make the decisions. It's discussed, of course, in Genesis 3. Prior to Adam's uh, existence, there was a system whereby man set his own rules, his own set of standards, what was good, what was evil. He determined this himself. And of course, total chaos must have existed on the face of the earth. And it's the very purpose or reason why uh, Adamic man was, was uh, set upon the earth, uh, created bara upon the earth uh, by God. Now, we see the evidence remaining of this same system uh, where man is the, is the God. Man sets the rules in many parts of the world today. And of course, unfortunately, again, with secular humanism, it has encroached here into, uh, into the United States of America, the great Christian Republic. So as I mentioned earlier, it seems as though we are going in the opposite direction from that that God had set Adamic man here to do in the first place. Now, <clears throat> certainly we can say this as a result of what happened in the garden here on earth among other peoples. We can say that when God told uh, or promised Adam, he said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, <clears throat> think in terms of the work, the hardship that Adam has had in bringing the world to God's standards over the last 6,000 years. It's been an uphill battle. So the ground, the earth, the world has been cursed because of what was done there in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the garden. And God told Eve this. He says, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Think in terms of what must have gone through Eve's mind when she thought about what Cain did. Think about this, the sorrow that Mother Eve must have had over this. In Genesis 26, 27, we can read, It were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah when Esau married the two Hittite women. So again, the sorrows that were brought to Adamic woman's being for what was done there. And of course, you see, nothing has changed. It's the same right to this day. So if you would, turn with me to Leviticus chapter 17. Where do the blood covenants fit into this? Just what is so important about the blood itself that the entire thread of the Bible is around the blood covenant? Let's uh, start in verse 10 of Leviticus chapter 17. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now, God simply told Moses to codify this and to write down and make the ordinances supporting it. But think about it, Adam knew this, Noah knew this, only recently have we discovered from a technical point of view that the life of the life is in the blood. Just recently, from a technical point of view, we learned what Adam knew and was told by God 6,000 years ago and was codified by Moses perhaps only 3,500 years ago. But uh, down deep inside the white blood cell is a thing called the DNA ladder. And a very strange thing happens, very simple. This DNA ladder is a spiral ladder, and it, it is truly a ladder. It's got rungs in it. And a little enzyme, a simple little enzyme, reaches out and stuffs a little piece, a building block, into that ladder. 
and reaches out again and stuffs another one in there. And that spiral starts, starts to form. It's called the DNA. And that little enzyme puts the proper, plate, the proper pieces into the proper order. And that order that that enzyme puts it in there is what determines whether that blood is the blood of an elephant or the blood of a man. Now, we just now find that out. So simple. And yet, we have people everywhere that simply will not believe God. We have people who believe in God. Lots of people say they believe in God. But how many of our so-called Judeo-Christians today, and how many even among us, really believe God? So these are the things that we must take into account. Now, <clears throat> the idea of a covenant, this blood covenant, any co covenant, in the biblical sense is different from that of a contract. A contract has a finite starting time and a finite ending time. A covenant, on the other hand, is of a permanent duration. It is, once a covenant is cut, it is then of a permanent duration. Contract generally also refers only to a part of a person, such as a scale, whereas a covenant refers to the entire being of the person. Every member of his body is in covenant with a situation. So we want to keep that in mind. The word covenant itself is number 1285 in Strong's and it's berith, and it means to cut. And oddly enough, as I mentioned yesterday, the word bara is the root word to berith, and of course bara means to create. And so this word cut is very akin to the very idea of creation. So covenant means to cut, and sure enough, that is exactly what was done all through the Bible. They cut covenants. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah 30, uh, 34, and we'll read uh, one example of cutting a covenant. <clears throat> this is just one type of cutting, and there are several ways to make this covenant. In Jeremiah 34, we'll start with verse 18. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf. Now this was one way of cutting a covenant. They just simply took the calf or whatever it was, cut it right down the middle, separated the parts out, they let the blood, of course, and they walked through it. Now, it seems like a strange way of doing it, but that was the custom, the way it was done uh, in cutting a covenant. And when they cut that covenant, it was a lifelong, substantial thing representing your whole being that, was, that, that covenant was made with. All right, so now, according to many students, not all, but many students feel that another method of cutting a covenant between two people and in the name of God was by simply cutting or pricking the, the palm of the hand or the wrist, and that these two people shook hands somehow or another to cause the... Uh, places where the blood was let to come in contact with each other and this was a system of cutting a covenant. Now, uh, from that, strangely enough, our handshake comes from that set of circumstances. And there are many places yet in the world where covenants are cut by doing that. I mean, they when they do this, they make themselves blood brothers and uh, in many places in the world today but we in Israel have, uh, because of one thing, and we'll talk about it later, we in Israel, we will give a handshake, but that handshake is representative, is, is uh, a symbolism of cutting a covenant. And of course, we older people uh, can remember the time when, when we shook, a hand, uh, shook our hands with anybody, 
it was done with the knowledge that when we did that, our handshake was as good as our signature. Amen. Now, many of us, even to this day, still feel that way, and when we do that, it is with the knowledge that we are symbolically cutting a covenant with you. And so it's that important. So <clears throat> when a blood covenant or such a covenant was cut, making them blood brothers, each of them at that time, back in those days, they pledged that everything that they were or ever were to be belonged to the other person. All of their earthly possessions, they belonged to the other person as well. They would give their cloak, this was just customary, they would give their cloak and their sword to the other person as a token of this pledge. The covenant did not end with that person's life either. That covenant carried on down through the generations to come. It was that important because it was an everlasting covenant when they did this. When they made themselves, as we would term it today, blood brothers, they did it that way. All right, so <clears throat> following cutting this covenant in this manner, they would sit down to eat bread and wine. Now this is, things are now beginning to, to, to fit together in our thinking here now as to what this is all about. But that is the way they did it. All right, so if you would, turn with me to the first, first Samuel in chapter 18. David had just killed the Philistine Goliath. And I want to point out something here. Goliath was about nine feet tall. He was neither black nor was he white. He was a mix. And he was called a Philistine. And he was also uh, from Alec, Alekites. He was that that was discussed in Genesis 6-2, and the sons of God found the daughters of men fair and took wives their choosing. It was not an angelic operation. It was the sons of Adam found the pre-Adamic man's daughters fair and they married them. And from that period on, they were giants and the word Nephilim is all, there is another word that goes with it, it's Raphaim. And if you go down into this, the Eucharites were the pre-Hebrews in the area of Palestine. And if you go to the Euteritic language, you will find that what is meant there. Now this is the language that predated the Hebrew language and uh, Euteritic language, and you will find that the word means a miscarriage, a monstrosity. So what we have seen there from Genesis 6-2 was a monstrosity because of mutations of genes. Now that is what we're talking about with Goliath. David had just killed the Philistine Goliath, as I had said, and he returned to Saul with the king, to uh, Saul the king with the head of, uh, of, of uh, Goliath in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. All right, now we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 18. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David cut a covenant. They made a covenant. It was a cut covenant covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Now that covenant that was made there was a blood covenant and some experts believe that it was done this way. Now I can't prove it, it doesn't say so, but they feel it was done like this with that pricking of the blood and making it a blood covenant. Verse 4. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. 
Now, everything was all right so far, just fine. But we all know that Saul was a bad seed. And so he became jealous when the women in the streets would start singing songs and go to verse 6. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to, and to me they have, ascri have ascribed but thousands. What can he have more than the kingdom? The only thing left for, kingdom, uh, for David to have was Saul's kingdom. And in verse 9, And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Now, that's exactly what he did. Saul became more jealous and hateful as the days went on. He vowed to kill David. He even went to Jonathan, his son, and to the servants and tried to get them cooked up into some frenzy to go kill David. But you see, Jonathan, Saul's son, remembered the cut covenant that was made between David and him, uh, Jonathan. So he told David that King Saul was out to kill him. So he did this because he loved David as his own soul and he cut a covenant with him. So he even did this in the face of the king, his own father. He did this on several occasions. He told him to hide. He reaffirmed this covenant. If you would turn with me to chapter 20. He reaffirmed this covenant one more time in chapter 20, verses 16 and 17. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemy. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Now, as they parted then, in verse 42, we read this. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For as much as we have sworn to both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So here we have Saul the bad seed, Jonathan the good seed, in conflict. And as you can see, Jonathan believed God, he believed what he had to say, and Saul believed in his own way. He only believed in man. So we have the good seed, bad seed, doing it God's way, doing it man's way. In chapter 31, Saul and his three sons, including Jonathan, were killed at Mount Gilboa, in the battle at Mount Gilboa. Then in 2 Samuel chapter 2, David was made king over the house of Judah. And then following that, following that, uh, that he was made king over Judah, there was a long and heated battle between the house of Saul and the house of David. And that battle continued and it got pretty hot. So if you would turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 4, and we'll read as to what follows here now. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, and in verse 4, we find that Jonathan had a son. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son. That would be Saul's grandson then. Jonathan's son, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And that was the tidings of, of uh, the death of all of them at Mount Gilboa. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame 
and his name was Mephibosheth. This is important. Let's go on. Mephibosheth was brought up in the house of Saul, of course. But all of that period of time, Mephibosheth had been taught of the hatred for David. Mephibosheth had been taught of the fear of David. Mephibosheth had been taught of the, of the conflict between the two great houses. And he was told that when king, uh, David was, was to become king, that he would steal all of his property and, and, and go with it. And so here was this terrible fear in the, in the in mind and the heart of Mephibosheth, this young man. All right, so turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. We'll start in verse 1. This is a very important story, and we, we've got to come down through this to, to understand really what the whole thing is about. And David said, is there yet anything that is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So you see, David remembered the covenant that he had cut with Jonathan. He remembered that and he knew that Jonathan was dead. He knew this from Mount Gilboa. He also remembered that the covenant was still in force that he made with Jonathan because Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Verse 2, And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And he said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. David then sent for the son, and in verse 6 we read this. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So you see, David considered Mephibosheth to be the same as Jonathan as far as that cut covenant was concerned. He respected that covenant because remember, they made and cut that covenant in the name of God. It was as simple as that. And in verse 11, As for Mephibosheth, said the king, as David, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. So now here we have a third example of the good seed and the bad seed concept. So it doesn't have to be twins. It can be father, son, it can be any relationship, but you have a good seed, bad seed situation. We have those right today. And we have, we have always, or well, recent years, we've been taught that, that bad seeds are strictly a matter of environment. That's what the secular humanist schools teach us. But only very recently they have rediscovered the wheel, reinvented the wheel, and found no, it is not that simple. It is right down to the very genes of the egg that made it. Amen. So uh, we have uh, we have uh, considerable authority on that now, uh, and I think that we can we can dispute the situation that it is all a matter of environment. So <clears throat> the entire story of Saul, Jonathan, Mephibosheth centers around a blood covenant that was made between David, Jonathan, and God. Now that is the basis of our story. So if you would now turn to Hebrews in the New Testament to chapter 9. <clears throat> the entire Bible, both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, is about a cut blood covenant. God says that the innocent blood must be shed for the remission of sins. In Hebrews 9 and verse 22, and almost all things are by the law 
purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Turn with me now to Hebrews 11. Now, I said earlier that Adam knew of the blood covenants. How do we know this? This is in the great faith chapter, and we can read this. By, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by in it he became dead yet speaketh. And in Romans, Romans 10 and 17, you don't need to turn there, we read this. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see, it was by faith that Abel knew this. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He knew that he was taught by Adam, his father, how this was done. Now I'll turn with me to Genesis 3, and we'll go to verse 21 in Genesis 3. Cain and Abel were told about the blood covenants and the blood sacrifices that were necessary. They were told by Adam. God had just finished the admonishments of Adam and Eve in the garden. And in verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make God make coats of skin and clothe them. So here is the first example of a blood sacrifice because in, uh, from an innocent animal because those animals had to be killed. There had to be blood let to make that skin. So here we have the first example of a blood sacrifice in the name of God. All right, so that was for the atonement of the sins of Adam and Eve. Now, both Cain and Abel were taught by Adam that they were to make blood sacrifices. In Genesis chapter 4, we can read this, starting in verse 1. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Now, in order to make the fat thereof, you had to kill the animal. You had a blood sacrifice and the flat fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel for his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. All right, so Abel learned from Adam of God's demands for righteousness and what constituted the requirements for atonement of sin, the blood covenant, the blood sacrifice. Cain did not do it. Now, if you would, turn with me to chapter 31 of Genesis. This goes down all the way through the Bible. There are all of these high spots showing this story going down through it. Jacob made a covenant with God. And he made a sacrifice with God at that time of that covenant. He had been having troubles, if you recall, just the chapters and verses before it, with Laban, his father-in-law, because uh, he had married the daughters and uh, they, uh, he had lived with, with Laban in his home for 20-some years. He had earned not only his daughters but the cattle and the goods that he had acquired during this time. And Laban was now all upset because... Uh, because he was leaving with all of these goods and his daughters, and he uh, wanted to fight it and to, uh, to tell him, no, you can't. But finally, they resolved the differences with a covenant. And let's start in reading in verse 44 of Genesis uh, chapter 31. Verse 44. Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee, and Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones, and they took stones, and made an heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. Now, oftentimes, in other places, that heap, that stone, that pile of stones, was a part of the covenant-making process. In verse 53, 
the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. And Jacob swear by the, fa by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount, and they did eat at that time, and called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. So Jacob cut a covenant and made a sacrifice of blood of an innocent animal for atonement and to formalize the covenant with between Laban and himself. It was cut between the two of them and God Almighty. The servants around, they were there, and they did too. They did eat also. But the covenant was cut between Laban and Jacob and God. All right, so now I don't know whether they lay, they, they cut the, the, whatever it was, calf or whatever, into two pieces, spread it out this way. Whether they did it that way or not, it doesn't say. And it's immaterial, but it does say that they made a blood sacrifice, they made a covenant, and they tarried there all night, and they did eat bread. And I must assume they also ate wine at the same time. Now, here is a very strong point. There is no reference anywhere to Esau ever making a blood sacrifice. I can't find it. Now, we have the second concept of good seed, bad seed. The Spirit of God was not in Esau. And the Spirit of God is not in Esau to this day because they refuse to make a blood atonement to God. They have been given the opportunity to accept Jesus and they have refused to do it. Now turn with me to Genesis chapter 8. Chapter 8 and verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered blood offerings upon the altar. Turn with me now to the 15th chapter of Genesis. So you see here was, here was Noah making a blood sacrifice. It came all the way down from Adam to this day. Abraham was blessed for his right doing, and right doing there is the judgments according to God Almighty. And if you recall, Abraham went over and, and had war with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah just because they had kidnapped Lot. And he killed him, and he returned with his with his uh, uh, with Lot, and God blessed him for this for his right doing. It was that that was his right doing. Reading in verse uh, seven, Genesis fifteen, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him. Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, and he took them all of these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each one piece one against the other. But the birds divided he not. Now, I, I, I don't understand in my mind why he did not divide the birds, and that, that's that subject of some more thought. But, uh, I'm sure there's a reason there, but he didn't divide the birds. God right there cut a covenant with Abraham. And there was the blood of these several innocent animals shed to officiate the promise and for the atonement of sin. All right, so all of these examples happened a long, long, long time before Moses was given the codified, the law, statutes, and judgments. They were there all the time before that. Abraham knew that it was wrong to kidnap because God told him it was wrong to kidnap. And so 
Moses codified it, put it down, wrote ordinances about it as to how you would kill, uh, you would stone them to death and things of this nature. You wouldn't shoot them or hang them or whatever, but you stone them to death in an ordinance manner. So <clears throat> the Old Covenant was based on the letting of blood and the life that is in it. Now, there are some students who feel that no, those covenants were let because of the death that was in the blood. Other students feel no, it was let because of the life that is in the blood. I am the, of the latter point of view. It is, it, life is in the blood and it was to represent the life that was in the blood in cutting the covenant, in making the covenant. All right, so <clears throat> the only difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is that now we don't put an, uh, a, a, a kill an animal on the altar and let the blood and sacrifice them to God for, for every little promise or every little problem or every little time that we have a need for remission of sin. We now do it in the name of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. It's as simple as that. From that day forward, it was all over all the cutting of the covenants. But a covenant is still there, and it is still a blood covenant. We do not have to be circumcised to uh, have the blood covenant with God. We are symbolically pricked or circumcised in our heart in the name of Jesus Christ. When we shake hands now, we symbolically carry on a covenant. And for that reason, I think that we should be very careful in shaking hands and and uh, and recognizing I think we should recognize what we're doing when we do this uh, in Rome people witnessed handshakes by uh, there would be people witnessing these things and when uh, when someone shook a hand it became a contract it became a legal contract and in the early days of this country uh, the Israelites here would not shake hands with anybody but a fellow Israelite. They would not shake hands with other peoples. And so it's that important. In Hebrews 6 and 20, the writer tells us this, Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, personally, I don't believe Melchizedek was a physical king of Salem, city of peace. I don't believe it. I believe that it, Melchizedek is exactly what it says it is. It is an order. It is a system. It is a priesthood. And that's the word that's used in it. Given to Adam all the way down this way. We had the ordinances. We had the law, statutes, and judgments. We still have the law, statutes, and judgments. We no longer have the ordinances. We have those. They were simply codified by Moses and put into ordinance point of view, but they were there. They have been there all the way from the beginning, and they are there today. But we don't have the ordinances of making the blood sacrifices as it was done in those days. All right, so turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews 9. Let's start in reading in verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Now you see, David knew that. And that testament that was cut, that covenant that was cut between Jonathan and David lived after the testator, Jonathan, died. And it is exactly the same way 
with Jesus Christ and us. If you would uh, uh, remember the song L.E. Jones wrote in 1899. It says, There is power in the blood. You recall the song, you all know it, and it says this, There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Now you see, that's true, and it's exactly the same kind of covenant that was cut all the way from the beginning. Only this time, Jesus cut that covenant with God as the witness to us. We have that same blood covenant right to this day. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we cut covenants. In the name of Jesus Christ, we take communion. And that communion is symbolic of reaffirming that covenant. We take bread and wine to reaffirm the covenant that we had with Jesus Christ. Jesus was, was like David. We're like Mephibosheth, lame in the feet. But you know, just exactly like it was between Mephibosheth and David, we have the right and the gift to sit at the feet at the king's table and eat. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. God bless you.